Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live here on World Harvest Television Network. And friends, we have a very special broadcast for you this evening. Uh, as you can see here on your screen and behind me here, Nephilim, the greatest global threat. That might sound pretty provocative title here, uh, but let me tell you something. I'm sure there's many that are watching that would rather see it say Russia, the greatest global threat. After all, Russia has been so demonized by the United States and, uh, of course, <laughs> many on both sides of the aisle. Although President Trump has tried to bring about some peace with Russia, but still the mud is sling, sling continually against Russia. And what really has driven me to want to bring this message together is all because of the Russia phobia. Mainly what gets me is because what I'm seeing on a smaller scale amongst different denominational believers and the practically bitter hatred that they have for one another over different doctrinal issues, what happens when that type of mentality and that type of thinking becomes on a global scale? Then you have wars. Then you have rumors of wars. But is it really the leaders of these nations? Is it really President Trump wanting to destroy Russia? Or uh, is it really President Putin wanting to destroy the United States? I don't think so. In fact, I think it's just the opposite. Because we see with President Trump and President Putin in the, in the beginning, they were trying to get along. And yet, both these men, both these men have a sort of Christian type of background and a Christian type of theme for their own presidencies to, as President Putin, reviving the Russian Orthodox belief of Yeshua in his country there, uh, bringing it back from the days of the communistic atheist type of belief, restoring dignity back, going to Syria, trying to rescue the Christians there. And at the same time, President Trump, regardless of what you may think of his own personal belief, nonetheless has surrounded him with the evangelical community, Christians of all walks of life, and although some I question as far as that, but the point being here is he has also tried to bring Christ back into the White House, so to speak. He removed the idols of different religions from the White House. And when you think about this, Russia being a Christian nation, Christian values, Christian culture, the United States supposed to be a Christian nation with Christian values and Christian principles, why then would we possibly ever want to go to war with one another? unless something else, someone else, is actually controlling the country. Because after all, we are brothers. Has anybody ever forgotten the fact that we are brothers? As Christians? Even President Putin going to Syria to do what? He went there to help rebuild and to protect the Christian community of the Eastern Orthodox faith. But, as we know, Rome and, of course, the Eastern Church have been at war for years. And wars have resulted in that very ideology of Roman Catholicism against the Eastern Orthodox Church. And the wars have certainly blazed throughout the entire world. Because although they both claim Christianity... Somebody else must be in control. Let's take a look at this as we go into this now, though. I'd like to take you to Matthew chapter 24. We'll read right there, verses 37 to 39, to set the stage of tonight's message here. Uh, those of you that are joining us here on World Harvest Television Network, God bless you. Thank you for watching. Uh, don't forget, please, we need your support in making the broadcast possible. At the end of this broadcast, you can see our mailing address that will appear at the bottom of your screen, or you can visit IsraeliNewsLive.org, and you can contribute online there. Thank you, and God bless you for that. Anyway, Matthew chapter 24, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, 
We're going to get into the part about the marrying and giving in marriage in just a little bit because it applies here. But one thing I want to really focus on is the fact is what it was like during the days of Noah. Now don't forget, Yeshua already talks about earlier in the chapter the wars and rumors of wars and the nations rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, the beginning of sorrows, earthquakes, uh, you know, pestilence, the sea of roaring, everything you can imagine, all the calamity that could possibly come upon the earth he talks about in Matthew 24. But then, later in the chapter, he brings out this one here in verse 37 to 38 and 39 there. As it was in the days of Noah, it seems to me that the Lord was setting up a visual for us, knowing that it's not just written in the book of Enoch, but it's also written in Genesis chapter 1. And we read about, I'm not sorry, Genesis chapter 6, not chapter 1. We read about what goes on there. Let's take a look though at what Enoch has to say about this. Chapter 8, read with me here. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of autonomy and the, and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and coloring tinctures and there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Simyaz taught enchantments and root cuttings. Amaros, the resolving of the enchantments. Bakrael, astrology. Kokabel, the constellations. Ezekiel, the knowledge of the clouds. Archiel, the signs of the earth. Shamsel, the signs of the sun. Sariel, the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried and their cry went up to heaven. Think about that. As the men perished, their cries went up into heaven. Sounds a lot like the story of Cain and Abel, doesn't it? If you look at the story of Cain and Abel, we realize that when Cain kills Abel, what happens? His blood crieth out from the earth. So the sons of God, the true sons of God, not talking about the fallen angels that we see in Genesis chapter 6 here, but the sons of God, their cry comes up unto the very gate of God because of all the fighting and the wars that have broken out and the people that are dying. And believe me, and I don't, I'm not sitting here to say that the Apocrypha is the inspired word of God, but read it with caution and with spiritual insight. But it's very interesting to look at these things from a prophetic standpoint. Because you can look at the book of Enoch and read about the size of the giants and say, oh my gosh, how in the world could they even mate with women? But oddly enough, there are Apocrypha works out there that actually explain that. And that's something that most people don't even think about. Uh, they totally bypass that altogether. Yet you have to forget, even in the book of Enoch, they're able to change their form. In fact, in one Apocrypha writing, it says that they changed their form because the women would not uh, even, even consider sleeping with them. So they changed their form to make themselves look and appear as if it were their own husbands. And that's that part's not in Enoch, it's another Apocrypha. I do not recall which one it's in, but in the book of Enoch, it does speak about how they have that power to change their form. So if they can change their form, they can literally shrink themselves down to be a man no bigger than five, six, five, eight, five, ten, six foot, whatever the case were of the men back in that day there. All right? So let's don't just assume that they couldn't do it. But the point that we're looking at here, the main issue right now at this point in this part of the message is we're looking about the fact that it was these fallen angels that taught the art of war. And that's where the danger comes in. I want you to listen to President Eisenhower in his closing remarks because we're going to examine the fact of how could the Nephilim be returned? How could they be in control of the governments? How could we be fighting one another if it weren't for some outside influence that is a very ungodly influence working in behind the scenes there? So I want you to hear what 
President Eisenhower said in his own closing speech there uh, as he was getting ready to leave the White House. Listen to this here. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime, or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. How to do this? Now, I don't know about you, but that is totally amazing to me. Did you notice how President Eisenhower speaks about that before these major wars that we've had in modern times? The United States industry was not dedicated to becoming the industrial military complex. In fact, President Eisenhower warns against uh, the, 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 the citizens against the industrial military complex because it becomes so vast, so huge, so large that it's uncontainable. Now, the question has really arisen as to whether or not who is in charge of that military industrial complex. Take a look at your screen right now. Two different articles that we have here. One RT, Paul Heiler, who is the, uh, he is the former defense minister of uh, Canada. And he speaks of uh, proof of an alien presence, overwhelming science and a fault for dismissing it. Also, Edward Snowden, uh, in this leaks lunch uh, from Star Tribune, put this title out, Snowden bombshell, aliens helped Hitler. He says, sure, right, or look at this way, if you were part of the alien conspiracy, how would you discredit anyone who attempted to reveal your secret plans for humanity? Simple, reveal the plans yourself with a few details changed. The only things that explain this, former National Security Agency NSA contractor Edward Snowden revealed documents providing in, uh, controversial proof that an alien extraterrestrial intelligence agenda is driving U.S. domestic and international policy and has been doing so at least, uh, at least basically since 1945. Now, I'm not going to go deeper into the article at this point here with you, but let me tell you this much here. In Russia, the vice president of Russia was actually on a talk show and I wish I'd have brought this up on the screen here for you to see this here and is being interviewed by the news person there about aliens inside of Russia and although the common news commentator thought that this was funny he never laughed Medvedev did not laugh found nothing funny about it whatsoever. But he did say, when the question was posed about how many aliens were among them, he said if the number, the true number, were revealed, it would cause a mass panic inside of Russia. So think about it. You know, we have government officials, such as the former uh, defense minister of Canada speaking about this. We've had Several people that have come out publicly. We had uh, Gen uh, excuse me, Admiral Byrd that uh, claimed to have fought against alien type of aircraft UFOs when he went down to do his uh, Antarctica uh, exploration trip there with, with a huge military convoy. There's been all types of documentation and at least conspiracy theories that Hitler was very much involved uh, with uh, extraterrestrials and this is how he got his knowledge to build the bombs that he has. And at the same time, we have Yeshua himself, Jesus of Nazareth, saying that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be again in the coming of the Son of Man. Now what's in critical though is we have to remember that he talks about the marriage given and given in marriage and in the Hebrew language one of those marriages are not of a free will. Okay? And then the other, a little different there. But, uh, and also the eating and drinking. What were they eating and drinking before the flood? Well, according to the book of Enoch, they were eating and drinking 
human flesh and drinking blood. That's actually returned to modern days as well. I know in secret societies they talk about eating and drinking human flesh and blood. Uh, I have saw all kinds of conspiracy theories that there are lizard type people that transform uh, lizard aliens or something like this that can transform themselves to look like a human being. Now, I've seen a vision of this before so I can believe that there could be some truth to that. I know that may sound far out to say that but then again remember those angels, the fallen angels could transform transform their forms and they're not completely out of commission either because Enoch says that they even though they're imprisoned they would still cause man to go astray let's further on with some of this this article right here uh, says here shock claim China and Russia taking over from West because they are aided by aliens another news article that just came out and at the same time, we have that one there in the same article. It goes down. Mr. Rhodes, uh, who was speaking about this, says, also appears to believe an Illuminati conspiracy theory that secret societies run by beings from outer space actually pull the strings of global government from behind the scenes. Now, I have to tell you, friends, I don't believe in aliens, per se. I do believe, though, that Satan's demons, you have to remember there's a large number that were cast out of heaven and not all of those demons were put in the prison on this planet that would still be interfering in our lives not all of them were put here and people can say all day long you know you can be possessed of a devil sure you can that's a little different and I agree with that but don't think that Satan doesn't have that ability to get here we had giants in the days of uh, of David and the kings of Israel, etc. How did they get beyond the flood? How did we end up with a bunch of giants in, in the world today after the flood? I thought the destruction of the flood killed them all off. Well, they, there was a way they got back. We're going to look at that. But the, the, my point is, if before, in Enoch's day, before the Andalusian destruction, the world was being destroyed because these fallen angels had taught the art of war and caused our brethren to fight against one another, then that's why we see it today. That's why the same thing is happening. Pearl Harbor, for an example. My grandfather was there driving down the road, bullets coming through the roof of his car. My grandmother in the back seat. You know, then you have World War II, Hitler. By the way, these images are disturbing. I apologize. I should have put a note. Maybe I'll put that in the editing there, a note there about some of these images are disturbing. But World War II, Hitler, when he ravaged the entire, entire world over there, and not just the Jews. We had 6 million Jews killed in the Holocaust. But did you know that 20 million Russians died as well to come and liberate not only the Jewish people in the Holocaust, they even were liberating American and British soldiers captured by the Germans. I've seen some beautiful stories about that and even their reunions with one another because of the love that these men have for one another because of the liberation of the, of the Red Army. And I realize the Red Army, you know, some people try to say, you know, oh, it's the Ukrainians that liberated Auschwitz. Don't forget, Ukrainians are both Russian and Western type. Ukraine, they're both Ukrainians, but they were under the Soviet Red Army Command as well. But yes, there were Russians involved in that battle as well in the liberation of Auschwitz. In fact, that was the first news to the entire world that the Holocaust really was so heinous. Pravda. Their news actually covered it the very next day of the barbarism that was going on. The thing is, the world just didn't catch on that much because Russia is more of a closed society. But Pravda News reported just how insidious it was. But then again as well, there were many uh, American military that also began to liberate Holocaust camps. In fact, Peter Thomas, the late Peter Thomas, just died a couple of years ago. Very good friend of ours. He was the, uh, the voice and narrator on Forensic Files. Also NPR, he was a narrator on many different shows on NPR as well, National Public Radio. Peter Thomas, I had the privilege of sitting down with him on multiple occasions talking about his experience in World War II 
because he was there as well, liberating one of those camps there that the United States liberated, the U.S. Uh, Army did. And as Peter said to me in his own words, and he's been here on Israeli News Live as well. If I could have found the video, I'd have put it up. Him and Laurie Cardoza and Moore, they were both in an interview with me together, and we were talking about what he saw. And the one thing that Peter said, with all the killing, with all that happened in the war, nothing moved him more than when he saw what was happening to the Jewish people in these concentration camps. I know there are concentration, there's death camps, there's all types of different camps that they had in Germany, but the death camps, of course, being the most heinous of all the camps and what they did. And no wonder why so many Jewish people still love the Russian people for helping to liberate them. And a lot of times people have no idea the close unity that was between uh, President Roosevelt and that of Stalin, uh, though he's a dictator of Russia, they still work together. It was Stalin that was begging President Roosevelt to enter into the war. And he promised that he would create a second front. It took him about a year and a half before he ever actually did it, but he does it. And even after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the U.S. was fighting against Japan, then the president asked uh, Stalin to help the United States to defeat Japan, and Russia did exactly that. Stalin, though he had already suffered the loss of 20 million people, sent his men to the battlefront with Japan and helped to defeat Japan in the, in the victory there. We have been friends with Russia the entire time. Why? Because there is a common core value. The Russian Orthodox Church though we may have differing opinions on the ideology of, of fundamental views, they still believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But the wars continue to rage on. Brother against brother. In Iraq, the United States here, the Iraq war here, the devastation that it brings. All right, In Syria, the devastation it brings, both from the United States and from Russia, Syria, bombing, trying to get rid of ISIS. And even as President Trump clearly pointed out, as President Barack Obama, along with his administration, that helped create ISIS in the first place. Very troubling indeed there. Now, another issue that I've got to bring up here is where these fallen angels were imprisoned. Because we've got to get into the issue of how, how then, if we have all this chaos in the world, how then are these fallen angels controlling the governments? How did they get here in the begin, to begin with? How does this all happen? All right, I'll show you exactly that. Now, I want to start off though. Remember John Kerry, his visit to Antarctica? According to the Express News here, they said it was to, see, to visit secret Nazi UFO base. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry visited Antarctica to examine the remains of a secret Nazi UFO base. It has extraordinarily been claimed. There's all kinds of things, you know, because he went down there on the day of the election. Of all things, when President Trump running against Hillary Clinton, he goes down there on the day of election. When he leaves there, he goes to New Zealand and he's there, I forget, I think it's the Church of St. Stephen or something like that, and there was a huge earthquake afterwards there and all kinds of conspiracy theory uh, news articles came out saying that he, he had went to the Antarctica to speak to the watchers and they refused his protest to stop Trump from entering into the White House. That could be conspiracy theory. I have no idea. But I will show you some things, though, that I do believe are real. Let's look at this here. Enoch chapter 18. I saw at the end of the earth the firmament of heaven above. And I proceeded and saw a place which burns day and night, where there are seven mountains of magnificent stones, three towards the east, three towards the south. And as for those towards the east was of colored stone, and one of pearl, and one of jacinth, and the, the, those towards the south of red stone. But the middle one reached to heaven like the throne of God, of alabaster, and the summit of, uh, of the throne was of sapphire. And I saw a flaming fire, and beyond these mountains is a region, the end of the great earth. There the heavens were completed. 
And I saw a deep abyss with columns of heavenly fire, and among them I saw columns of fire fall, which were beyond measure, like towards the height of towards the depth, and beyond that the abyss. I saw a place which had no firmament of the heaven above, no firmly founded earth beneath it. Moving on. There was no water upon it, no birds, but it was a waste and horrible place. I saw the seven stars like great burning mountains. And to me, when I inquired regarding them, the angel said, this place is the end of heaven and the earth and earth. This has become a prison for the stars and the host of heaven. And the stars which roll over the fire are they which have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in the beginning of their rising because they did not come forth at their appointed times. And he was wroth with them and bound them till the time when their guilt should be consumed, even for 10,000 years. And your isle said to me, Here shall stand the angels who have connected themselves with women and their spirits assuming many different forms are defiling mankind and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as gods. And here shall they stand till the day of great judgment in which they shall judge till they are made an end of. Now, friends, I got to tell you something. You're going to watch really closely now because now we're going to begin to look at where these angels are imprisoned in the description that it gives here in the book of Enoch. And also notice that fire, like a veil is what it's described like, a dry place, there's no birds, there's no nothing, a desert. And we're going to talk about where that may very well be. Follow me here. This website here is called Vincent Summit of Antarctica, 4,897 4, meters high. It is an interesting summit there. I've done a video about this before when I talk about the Nephilim and where uh, the, the fallen angels are imprisoned. And of course, the Nephilim are only the children of those fallen angels. But the thing was, when I began to examine the uh, the documentation that is written in the book of Enoch, one place stood out when I began to look. Because I noticed that Enoch describes that it was neither day nor night there. Antarctica fits the bill for that. It can be 24 hours daylight all the time. In other words, the sun never goes down, the moon, you know, you see what I'm saying? It's just all the time daytime, right? Now we know that's only part of the year, and part of the year it's all in full darkness, just like the North Pole is. All right, then the other thing was, there was no birds. Well, when you go far enough into Antarctica, there ain't nothing there. There's no light, seems like hardly at all, except on the outer coast there, where we still have penguins and things. And at the Hill of the Seven Summits, when it speaks about those seven mountains in the Book of Enoch there, and how three go to the south and three go to the east, well, if you take into consideration the Earth has shifted its position since the Andalusian destruction, and scientists believe that to be so, then you would have perfectly south and perfectly east those three mountains coming off of that one center peak as the way it's described there. Uh, and as far as a desert-like place, Antarctica, on the very website you're looking at now, is called the driest continent on planet Earth with only one inch of rainfall annually, the driest desert in the world, and as they call it, the coldest desert in the world. Everything about Antarctica fits the very place, the chasm, no heaven above, no bottom, there's huge, huge cavern down in there. And they talk about this being an underground base and conspiracy theories and stuff. And we say conspiracy theories, but there are governmental people that have backed this up about secret base that goes up underneath that. And then there's this, the, you know, not just that, but we have two. When the Russians sent down an exploratory ship there, this is in Russian news. Now, I know it was on conspiracy websites as well, but in Russian news, they go, they make a stop by there in Saudi Arabia right after that supposed stampede killed all these thousands of people. 
And in some Russian news, they actually spoke about that it was an ark that was discovered there called the Ark of Gabriel. And it had to be transported to the South Pole. Is that because of these fallen angels? Isn't it interesting? Right after Pope Francis and the uh, Mr. Uh, the the uh, Kirill, the the Russian Orthodox uh, high priest for the Russian Orthodox Church there, they met in Cuba. Right after that, Kirill goes down to South America, and then unexpectedly, he ends up at the Antarctica. So many people were going to the Antarctica at this time. And all kinds of theories have gone on out there saying it's because it's where they call it aliens. Maybe it's the fallen angels. I'll explain why. Let's go back to the part about the women. Remember how Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, they were, it shall be again, they were marrying and given in marriage. They did this. They were eating and drinking. And as I say, stated to you, we know from the book of Enoch, they were eating and drinking blood, <clears throat> eating human flesh, devouring the humans. It's clearly written in the book of Enoch. That's what we see also in Syria, in this war. Not from the Syrian soldiers, but rather from those Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and ISIS members, the very militants that we have backed as a U.S. government have been seen to devour human flesh and drink human blood in this war. And that's who we backed. What a shame and what a disgrace on the American flag for that to happen. Now, as we look at this, though, remember, they were marrying and given in marriage. A given in marriage is not the bride's will. All right? Watch what it says here in Leviticus, because remember, Yeshua said that day would repeat. Now, he said it would repeat after his particular time, but it also repeated in the times of David and even before the children of Israel ever came to the Promised Land. Look at Leviticus chapter 18. And thou shalt not give any of thy seed to set them apart to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 21. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 9 and 10. And when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, one that useth divination of, of a soothsayer or an enchanter or a sorcerer. Did you notice what it says here? Even in Leviticus, in the King James, they use the expression, do not let your children pass through the fire to Molech. Now the word fire there is not written in the Hebrew language. But the thing is, in Deuteronomy, they do use the word fire. If you were to go into the book of Kings as well, we would find a very similar story that happens there. And God is talking about driving out that when Israel is to come and to take the promised land, they're to drive out the Hittite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, all these different nations. Why? They had intermingled in. Their seed had crossed through the fire to Molech. Do you know that one of those fallen angels, if you, you have to look up, it's actually in an Arabic document that speaks about the different angels that were imprisoned. One of them is Molech. It is a name that I've even checked with scholars that would line up with Moloch. That's what one of them's name is. And you know, the interesting thing is, is it said that he looks like a bull, one of the favorite sacrificial animals of different cultures, including the Egyptian culture. Now, Passing through the fire, thy seed. Don't let your sons, your daughters pass through the fire. I believe that fire is, a, is in representation in the book of Enoch when these angels are imprisoned there. 
And in fact, in the book of Enoch, it even says that these angels would still cause man to be led astray. Though they're imprisoned in possibly Antarctica, a conjecture of course, but though they be imprisoned there, though there is a veil of fire that keeps them where they are, they can still pass through. How else then do we get giants on the earth? How did it happen? And I have actually spoken to people in modern days that have, that have inside knowledge about this very thing that say that, that, that the government has been involved in doing that exact thing. Passing through the fire to Moloch. To bring forth children that are hybrid. Is it true or not? I have no idea. But somehow or another they had to have gotten here. Let's look also. Let's take a look here at Book of Enoch here. Chapter 9. And they have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth and have slept with the women and have defiled themselves and revealed to them all kinds of sins. And the women have borne giants and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness. And now behold, the souls of those who have died are crying and making their suit to the gates of heaven and their lamentation have ascended and cannot cease because of the lawless deeds which are wrought on the earth. As I told you, we saw what happened there. Yeshua says, as it was then, so would it be in, this, in the day that we're living in. Now, a lot of people think, take that when Jesus says they will be uh, marrying and given in marriage, they say that's just promiscuity. Uh, the marrying and divorcing and remarrying. But that's not what it is in the, in the Hebraic language either. Alright? The given in marriage is not a, a willing participant. Just like in the case of when the seed passed through the fire to Molech, it's not a willing participant. Both male and female. What in the world are they doing? Alright? And then we see here that even as I read to you earlier, these fallen angels could change their form. These women had no idea who, who these men really were. They thought it was their own husbands, according to one apocryphal writing I read before. All right. Now, I've got to share with you, though, in Deuteronomy, so you can see this whole story about giants. Chapter 2. Let's take a look at this. And the Lord said unto me, Be not at enmity with Moab, neither contend with him in battle, for I will not give thee of his land. For a possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. The Amin dwelt there aforetime, therein aforetime, a people of great and many and tall as Anakim. These also are accounted Rephaim as the Anakim, but the Mobites call them Emin. <laughs> Giants. Do you know in Hebrew, in, in, in some place when you're looking at this, it actually is written in Hebrew, Nephilim. The giants were in the land. Not only were they in the land where Lot's children were living, but they were also in what we call the modern state of Israel, where they were to go drive them out there. Esau had driven them out of his land. And Lot's children had driven them out of his land, their land there. Which, I don't know if you've noticed this or not. This is something interesting about this to me. You know, there's this big move. They call it the, 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 uh, the greater Zion, Zionism uh, going on in Israel, of taking the land from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates River. And I know that God said to Abraham, I've given you this land. And he says to, to Abraham, from the Nile all the way to the Euphrates River. That's Abraham's children, okay? That is Abraham's descendants. Alright? Abraham's people, we might say. Lot was his nephew. And Abraham told Lot, choose where you wanted to go. God says to Moses, I have given them this land. You know what that land is? The modern state of Jordan. That's where it's at. We don't have no right to it, friends. We don't. We don't have no right to Syria either because why? Jacob made a covenant with Laban not to cross that heap in Gilead to do him harm. By the way, Gilead is laying over in the modern uh, state of Jordan today. So Jordan should give Gilead back to Israel because it's 
their land. All right? But the point is, it's the giants. The giants that were in the land then. And yet, Yeshua said this is going to repeat in this day. So when we see the wars that are going on, now as we see what's coming up, a war coming, U.S. Marines warned to be ready for big blank fight amid rising tensions with Russia and North Korea. That same general right here pictured on your screen. The warning on Thursday came the day uh, before Defense Secretary Jim Mattis told troops at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, that storm clouds are gathering over, over the Korean Peninsula. Neither, excuse me, Neller, which is General Neller, said that the U.S. military could shift its focus from the Middle East to Europe, Eastern Europe, and citing Russia's conflicts with Ukraine and Georgia as justification. Why do we want to go kill our brothers? Do you know I've watched even in the Ukrainian conflict, Roman Catholic priests go in there and bless the fighters of the neo-Nazi Ukrainians and Russian Orthodox priests go and they bless the fighters of Eastern uh, Ukraine to fight against the Nazi Ukrainians that are Roman Catholic. And yet they both claim to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. How can we have this? How is this possible in this day if it's not some type of outside influence? Maybe the aliens or the demons are actually running some of these churches. Russia tests the powerful ICBM capable of overcoming missile defense shield. That's the Topol IM. Tyler Durden on Zero Hedge says here, as North Korea, uh, Varosha, excuse me, Bosporously condemns the U.S. and the United Nations after the Security Council passed yet another round of sanctions against the restive regime. Russia is continuing to test ICBMs in preparation for a violent conflict on the neighboring Korean Peninsula, where simultaneously calling for both sides to seek mediation. And then we as a Christian nation too, what do we do? According to RT, they say the U.S. lets militants train mount attack from its Syrian bases. Chief of Russian General Staff is claiming this. He goes on to say the U.S. is hosting uh, training camps for militant groups in Syria, including former ISIS fighters who fled from Raqqa, said the head of Russian General Staff, Valery uh, Gerasimov. Citing data obtained by aerial surveillance, the U.S. forces have effectively turned their military base near the town of Altant in the southeastern Syria into a terrorist training camp, uh, Garaskamov said in an interview to Russia's, uh, oh, excuse me, Kamasomolo, I can't even pronounce that name, Pravda Daily on Wednesday. All right. Now, <laughs> it's terrible. Why are we involved in training these people? Why are we there fighting against our own brother, our own sisters? Why? After all, President Trump, Newsweek, Trump's White House as evangelicals on speed dial says activists who prayed over the president. I mean, can you really explain to me this? You know, I mean, I have some differing views as far as President Trump you know, when I've listened to his own statements of his faith of Christianity. But nonetheless, he does take and embrace the, 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 the Christian community. And he tries to make his stand with Israel. Doing what he believes to be the right thing to do. What about President Putin? Putin's God Squad, the Orthodox Church and Russian politics. Not to mention his reviving of the, uh, of the faith back to Russia once again after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And here he is, he's a former KGB agent. If you've ever heard this man actually testify of what he believes and how he's passionate about his belief and goes to church uh, as well. You know, again, you know, I'm more of an independent believer. You know, I have issues with, with churches that are into idolatry, that are into idols, etc. When I say sometimes the Russian uh, Orthodox Church is like the Roman Catholic Church in that principle, in 
the statues and the icons and things like that, yes, they are the same. But when it comes to like Illuminati type of things, no, you'll never find it in a Russian Orthodox Church. I, at least I have never. In all of Israel, when I went through all the Russian Orthodox Churches there, you never see the all-seeing eye, the pyramid, the typical Illuminati symbols, symbols you don't see in a Russian Orthodox Church. Roman Catholic, filled with them, which lets you know who's controlling it. It says here on Newsweek, Putin vows to rebuild Christian Syria, restoring churches and bringing refugees home. Russia will help build Christian churches in Syria and establish uh, peace in historical Christian regions of the war-torn country. Russian President Vladimir Putin vowed on Monday during a meeting with representatives uh, of, of the Russian Orthodox Church. Over the past few years, the Russian state, alongside with the Russian Orthodox Church, as well as other religious organizations, have provided humanitarian aid to Syria. Putin told the meeting uh, attendees, according to the Russian state media, it's very important that the peaceful life is established as soon as possible, that the people can return to their homes, begin to rebuild the temples and churches. Now, that's a great deal different than when the Pope of Rome goes to Syria or to the, the camps where the Syrian refugees are and rejects the Christians that are trying to get asylum and takes only the Muslims back. Something's wrong. Something's majorly wrong, friends. This is why I say when we talk about, oh, well, Russia meddled in our election. That's like the pot calling the kettle black. You know, if they did, they did. But the point is, what election have we not meddled into as far as the United States? Openly, right now it's Russia did it secretly. Openly, President Barack Hussein Obama sends an entire delegation to try to stop Prime Minister Netanyahu from being reelected. That was openly. Look it up. We have been involved in trying to thwart elections, change the outcomes in so many places, including Ukraine, than you could ever imagine. In fact, Ukraine, think of the absurdity of Ukraine. They have a coup in the country. Petro Poroshenko is not the acting prime minister. Yanukovych is the prime minister, or the president of the country, actually, the president of the country. Instead of the United States siding with the president of the country to help him to gain control of his country, as did Russia, the United States takes the rebel forces that are doing all the fighting instead. Where, where's the honesty in all of that? And then we have the audacity to complain about Russia meddling in our elections. You know, the only thing I can see is that Somebody in Trump's staff met with Putin, you know, trying to assure them maybe that we could bring peace together, which is what should have been done. All right. I want you, though, so many people get the wrong idea about things. I want you to hear what John F. Kennedy had to say about Russia. He was not for communism, but he brought up some very solid points about Russia. Listen to what President Kennedy has to say here. As Americans, we find communism profoundly repugnant as a negation of personal freedom and dignity. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. Among the many traits the peoples of our two countries have in common, None is stronger than our mutual abhorrence of war. Almost unique among the major world powers, we have never been at war with each other. And no nation in the history of battle ever suffered more than the Soviet Union in the Second World War. At least 20 million lost their lives. Countless millions of homes and families were burned or sacked. A third of the nation's territory including two-thirds of its industrial base, was turned into a wasteland, a loss equivalent to the destruction of this country east of Chicago. Today, should total war ever break out again, no matter how, our two countries will be the primary target. It is an ironic but accurate fact 
that the two strongest powers are the two in the most danger of devastation. All we have built, all we have worked for, would be destroyed in the first 24 hours. President Kennedy had the right balance when it comes to Russia. He noticed their sacrifice. He noticed, noted how that we have been allies together. But he also noted something very important. I'm wondering if you notice this as well. He said that in the latter days, both the United States and Russia would become the target. So, of destruction that is. Both countries actually representing Christian ideology and a Christian foundation. Isn't it interesting that China is not the target, the communistic nation? Isn't it interesting that it's only Russia and the United States, two Christian, fun, fundamentally Christian nations? And we're, yet yeah, we're the ones being put at odds with one another. Maybe those devils want you to have communism so that they can control what religion they want you to hear. They don't want freedom of religion. All right? Which reminds me of Isaiah chapter 17. Let's take a look. The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Aram shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. So we find out that the, the kingdom will see, or the, the, the fortress for Ephraim will cease at the fall of Damascus. I've taught on this so many times. What is that fortress? President Bashar al-Assad, the very man that's been falsely accused of gassing his own people, which he never did. He didn't gas his own people. But the thing is, is when he is taken down from being the leader, then that Christian community, two million that used to be, they will try to wipe them completely out. You think these Arabs there care about, care about them at all? Not one single bit. Moving on here as we get ready to close here. Isaiah chapter 17 verse 9 and 10. In that day shall the strong cities be as the forsaken places which were forsaken from before the children of Israel after the manner of the woods and lofty forests and it shall be a desolation for thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation thou hast, done, thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold therefore thou didst plant plants of pleasantness and didst set with slips of a stranger friends you, I don't know if you realize how serious this is right here this slips of a stranger what is he talking about right here? That's an adulterous act. That is literally bringing about a pregnancy. It's an adulterous act. Is it speaking about bringing about the Nephilim? I don't really know, but the point is God is angry that Israel has allowed this to happen and he says it's because you were not mindful of your rock. Israel is not just the little country sitting in modern day Israel today. Israel are the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. Israel is in Russia. Israel is in the United States. Israel is NATO, or, or excuse me, European countries as well. These are all Christian nations and they have forgotten the rock of their salvation that Jesus Christ is that foundation. As Isaiah 17, 11 and 12 say, in the day of thy planting thou didst make it to grow in the morning thou didst make thy seed to blossom a heap of bows in the days of grief as a desperate pain and, ah the uproar of many peoples that roar like roaring of the seas and the rushing of nations that rush like rushings of mighty waters that's what you planted you sowed the cord of discord among your brethren here you have Christian nations that are representatives of Israel not just the three tribes that have returned home but all twelve tribes that are scattered abroad in the world and you fight against one another as Isaiah chapter 9 also brings out that 
Ephraim and Manasseh, they fight against each other, they devour one another's arm, and they, yet they both turn on Judah. No wonder why Jesus says in Matthew 24, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and the kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And you know what's interesting? I had it marked earlier. I just wanted to see if I had it in one of my notes here about that. There's actually a place right in here too where he speaks about those sorrows. I guess it was in another place there. It's going to share that with you. At any rate though, friends, thank you for watching. God bless you. And do remember Israeli News Live here as the year ends out here uh, and we go into a new year. We do need your help and keeping the broadcast going as well as here on our YouTube channel, uh, which that's not a big issue there, but we dedicate our lives to work day, day and night tirelessly to bring uh, prophetic insights to the news that we have as well as our teachings on the Institute to be able to bless you in that way there. So we just ask, remember us in your giving. That's IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can go there, IsraelReturns.com. And of course, at the bottom of your screen is our mailing address here in the United States, as well as our mailing address over in Europe. You can get that on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com, where we have our mailing address in Europe, uh, those of you that prefer to mail there. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live, Erev Tov, and God bless you. Shalom, shalom.